excellent book called Defending the Holy Land. And he said that Israel unleashed the June 67 war, quote, to restore the credibility of Israeli deterrence. And nothing to do with a fear of to live or to die or a blockade. We have to restore the credibility of Israeli deterrence. To restore the Arab world's fear that if you get out of line, you're going to be crushed. And that now will go fast forward to the reason many of you are here today, not for an excursion in history, but the Gaza massacre. And basically the main uh, the, uh, anticipation to the Gaza massacre was the uh, Israel's fear that it was losing its deterrence capacity. In May 2000, the Hezbollah, the party of God, uh, expelled the Israeli occupying army from South Lebanon after an 18-year-long guerrilla war. And uh, it was a, uh, Israel suffered a humiliating defeat. It was a defeat which was celebrated throughout the Arab world. For Israel, it was seen as its deterrence capacity having been undermined. And given that its deterrence capacity had been undermined, it made another war with Hezbollah inevitable. Why? To restore its deterrence capacity. And in summer 2006, Israel found its pretext when Hezbollah captured two Israeli soldiers. Several others were killed in a firefight. And Hezbollah demanded in exchange for these two soldiers the release of Lebanese prisoners held by Israel. Well, Israel has its pretext and it goes in with the fury of its, the full fury of its air force. It gears up for a ground invasion, but alas, in the summer of 2006, it suffers an even greater ignominious defeat than it did in May 2000. Uh, the dimensions of the defeat were quite staggering for Israel. A respected military analyst, uh, who was very partial to Israel, a fellow by the name of William Arkin, he did a study of the Lebanon War, and he says, the Israeli Air Force, the arm of the Israeli military that had once destroyed whole air forces in a few days, meaning the June 67 war, not only proved unable to stop Hezbollah rocket strikes, but even to do enough damage to prevent Hezbollah's rapid recovery. That's the Air Force. The Army was even a bigger disaster. Uh, once Israeli ground forces crossed into Lebanon, they failed to overtake Hezbollah's strongholds, even those close to the border. And it wasn't really, as I said a moment ago, it was a staggering defeat for Israel. If you just juxtapose some basic figures from the war, Israel deployed about 30 to 40,000 troops during the Lebanon War. On the other side, there were about 2,000 Hezbollah fighters and 4,000 irregular fighters, or about 30 to 40,000 versus 6,000. Israel delivered about 162,000 weapons during the war, rockets, artillery, and so forth. Hezbollah delivered about 5,000 which is to say the total number of weapons Israel, uh, Hezbollah fired in the war was the number Israel fired on each of the 34 days of the war. And what was even more staggering in the defeat was, in fact, Israel never even faced the crack Hezbollah troops, which had been stationed on the Latani River, waiting for the Israeli invasion that never happened. In the ground war it was basically village militias on the border with Israel, which had defeated or ground to the halt the Israeli army. Well, this was obviously a disaster of the first uh, order, and Israel was now itching to attack Hezbollah again. Its attitude was, we were down, we're down, but we're not yet out. Uh, but it hasn't yet had a military option against Hezbollah. And so beginning in mid-2008, Israel sought to conscript the United States for an attack on Iran. It was hoping if it attacked Iran, it would also be able to decapitate Hezbollah and therefore knock out its two main regional challengers. 
Israel and its uh, quasi-official emissaries, people like the sometime historian and uh, full-time propagandist Benny Morris, uh, they went around saying that if the United States doesn't attack Iran, this is mid-2008, if the U.S. doesn't attack Iran with conventional weapons, then Israel will have no choice, as Morris put it, but non, uh, that Israel will have to use non-conventional weaponry and many innocent Iranians will die. Well, the United States gave the thumbs down to an Israeli attack on Iran. The United States also said, we're not attacking Iran. Iran went and has gone its merry way. And now Israel's credibility, its deterrence capacity, uh, has slipped another notch. And it was high time for Israel to find a defenseless target to annihilate, to restore its deterrence capacity, and enter Gaza, Israel's favorite shooting gallery. Even in Gaza, the feebly armed Islamic movement Hamas uh, had defiantly resisted Israeli diktat, and in June 2008, it compelled Israel to agree to a ceasefire. Well, Hamas is the target. Hamas is how Israel is going to restore its deterrence capacity. It doesn't have the option of Hezbollah. It doesn't have the option of Iran. The natives are getting restless. They're getting too uppity. So let's go after Gaza. Well, what is, what is their strategy going to be in Gaza? Israelis were very straightforward about it. No mysteries, no perplexities, no black holes. They told you exactly what they were going to do. During the summer 2006 war in Lebanon, um, there's an area in the south suburb of Beirut called the Dahya. How many people know that? I'm just curious about Lebanese. Okay. I'm just learning the pronunciation. I thought it was Dahya, but Dahya, right? Is that correct? Dahya. How? Dahya. <laughs> Dahi. Dahi. Okay. I'm from Brooklyn, so hopeless. Um, and uh, during the war, they went into the southern suburb of Dahi, and they just flattened it. They turned it into a parking lot. Uh, I happen to have been there about a year ago now, and it looked pretty much like uh, what the bombed out cities, which were terror bombed during World War II, what they looked like in Europe. Uh, there's nothing there. Uh, they were mostly six-story apartment buildings belonging to poor Shia, who were strong supporters of the Hezbollah. Uh, and now, uh, there was nothing. Israel was very thrilled with what it did to the Dahir. Uh, and it started to talk about the Dahir strategy. You saw it all over the Israeli press. What's the strategy? Well, the IDF, the Israel Defense Forces, Northern Command Chief, he said, we shall pulverize the 160 Shiite villages in Lebanon they have turned into Shiite army bases. We shall show no mercy when it comes to hitting the national infrastructure. A reserve colonel in the Israeli Institute for National Security Studies said, if there is war, if there are hostilities, Israel will act immediately, decisively, and with force that is disproportionate. Such a response aimed at inflicting damage and meeting out punishment to an extent that will demand long and expensive reconstruction processes. In September 2008, the Israeli interior minister said, if there's a Palestinian rocket attack, the IDF should decide on the neighborhood in Gaza and level it. Well, that's the strategy, the Dahia strategy can't be used against Lebanon, because, you know, the Hezbollah, they're not fish in a barrel, obviously can't be used against Iran, so it's going to be used against Gaza. Pulverize it. And as the, op the operative plan for the Gaza bloodbath uh, became very clear from authoritative statements soon after the massacre go uh, got underway, a reserve general said early on in the massacre, what we have to do is act systematically with the aim of punishing all the organizations that are firing the rockets and mortars. 